Welcome to the rise and fall of globalization debate. Um, and we're going to talk about an issue that is really perhaps more urgent than, than it was even six months ago. So we've traded goods across the continents for centuries, in some cases for, for thousands of years. But it wasn't until the 20th century that globalization really came of age, with most primary goods being sourced internationally. And now there's a growing challenge to this phenomenon from across the political spectrum. And localism is a word favored by Brexiteers, by the left, even by Greens. So do we need urgently to pursue localism as a response to inequality, to excess, and to a crisis of resources that globalization has produced? Or is globalization a positive force? So um, globalization is in all kinds of trouble. Is localism... Uh, the future. Um, where shall we begin? Vince, is localism the future? Uh, yes, I, I don't see this antithesis between localism and globalism as you pose the question. I mean, I'm all in favour of more local decision making, uh, stronger local government. Uh, I'm all in favour of global integration because of the very great benefits it's brought since the Second World War. Uh, we had more trade, investment, people flow, uh, technology um, diffusing, uh, and it's brought in its wake a massive multiplication of living standards. Of course, it's brought problems, externalities, environmental and others, but in overall great benefits, particularly lifting hundreds of millions of people out of poverty, uh, out of absolute poverty, millennium goals being reached. Of course, we've had big problems with the financial crisis and latterly with um, uh, the pandemic, uh, but I think these are transitional problems, uh, and we will return, hopefully, uh, if the nationalist politicians like Trump uh, don't uh, throw a big spanner in the works, uh, to the, the kind of uh, integration that we were used to, hopefully with stronger systems of governance. Uh, as I say, you know, we've had Brexit, we've had Trump, uh, these are major interruptions with what is essentially a beneficial process. Mark, you, you supported um, Britain leaving one of the world's larger free trade areas. Does that mean that you're a fan of localism? You see that as the future? Uh, no, not at all. I mean, I broadly agree with Vince. Uh, I think he and I would probably share the view that in the UK in particular, uh, political power is ludicrously centralised. Uh, the, the, the number of decisions about expenditure and policy that are made uh, at a Whitehall level as opposed at a local level by councils or devolved assemblies by mayors, is, is ludicrous. It's, it's in excess, really, of 90% of power resides in Westminster, if you were to aggregate who's actually making spending decisions. So to that extent, I'm, a, I'm a, I believe, in devolution. But I take the threat to globalization, and I agree with Vince that there is a threat, uh, that uh, to come not from empowering political decisions to be made at local level, but the, the coming suggestion that we should strive enormously more for self-sufficiency. You mentioned, Isabel, at the outset that this term localism is used by lots of different people, but it seems to be used to mean lots of different things. Uh, it's very different to say that a local community should have greater powers over, let's say, its own transport infrastructure or setting uh, the curriculum in its own schools to suggesting that a local community should seek to make its own wine, build its own iPhones, construct its own cars, and be blocked off from the rest of the world in terms of the benefits of trade. And to underscore what Vince was saying, the, uh, the advances made by globalization, by which I simply mean the number of transactions crossing borders going up, is heroic. I mean, it, it is absolutely monumental. From 0 AD to 1800, average global incomes rose from about 800 US dollars in today's money a person to about $1,100. So from the 1800 years between the birth of Jesus Christ and the election of Thomas Jefferson to the US presidency, average global incomes rose by about 40% progress of a sort, I guess. But since 1800, when globalization begins, although I agree, Isabel, it's been more emphatically a 20th century issue, uh, incomes have risen by 1,200%. Uh, and it's and been staggering people. the last time. Uh, some people more, yeah, sure. But I mean, this is a colossal uh, advance in human prosperity 
and wealth. And Vince mentioned poverty. Extreme poverty has fallen from 94% of the human race in 1820, living in extreme poverty, to around 8 or 9% today. 8 or 9% too high, I, I, I grant you. You want that number to be 0%. But wow, we seem to have found the medicine to tackle this problem. Uh, similarly, life expectancy has risen since 1820 by uh, uh, average life expectancy was 35 years. Now, globally, it's 71 years. You'll be right that people living in rich Western countries, it's higher still than that. But the scale of progress has been, uh, I mean, absolutely remarkable. Probably the most spectacular human experiment, definitely the most spectacular human experiment in our history with unbelievably uh, spectacular results. If human welfare, prosperity and flourishing are what you're aiming for. So uh, whilst I would like to see political decentralization, and that does raise issues about how you go about that in order to ensure there are not uh, trade barriers, but I would like more decisions about local things taken at local level, I am worried that we are beginning to unravel this superb network of international globalized free trade that has brought with it unbelievably spectacular gains, uh, which we would Perfect. not want to see go into reverse at all. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Grace, um, some, some discussion about what localism is, but, but I'm guessing you have a rather clear idea of what it is. And, and do you see it as the future? Well, yeah, I mean, to me, localism means local democratic accountability. Um, and I think that is something that has perhaps been lost over the last phase of globalization that we've been through. And I think when discussing globalization, it's very important to identify a series of distinct phases. Now, of course, globalization, as we understand it today, is really a phenomenon that's, that's interwoven inexorably, really, with the process of the development of capitalism. So, you know, we have uh, several initial rounds of globalization starting, yes, arguably in around 1800. Uh, the, each of which are kind of punctuated by various forms of crises. So obviously, towards the end of the 1900s and the beginning of the 20th century, uh, you have this laissez-faire mode of globalization um, associated with you know, extremely high levels of uh, growing inequalities um, and also underpinned by a very extractive form of colonialism that ends with the Great Depression. Uh, you then have uh, a kind of you know, 15-year period of, of crisis, uh, which is followed by the creation of the Bretton Woods institutions after the Second World War. And that leads to this uh, phase of globalization that lasts from about 1945 to, uh, to around the mid-70s, uh, which is underpinned by those Bretton Woods institutions, so the creation of the IMF, the World Bank, um, the uh, GATT, which then became the WTO. Um, and uh, associated with that was a, a regime of exchange rate pegging. So the various major currencies around the world were pegged to one another uh, and uh, what well, sorry, were pegged to the dollar and the dollar was then pegged to gold. So this was underpinned by a particular form of, uh, of exchange rate management uh, effectively. And it was also associated with various other mechanisms to kind of hem in a very particular form of globalization, which was financial globalization. So uh, capital controls were, were quite common during this era. This then ended during the 1970s uh, when the US decides to come off gold famously, um, at least partly due to the emergence of this big current account deficit, partly due to the, the war in Vietnam, various other reasons. And after that, Bretton Woods is steadily unwound and you start to see the emergence of free floating exchange rates, capital account liberalization. And we enter a period of financial globalization, which comes around from about the 1980s. And obviously the crisis of that model is the financial crisis of 2008. Now, financial globalization is associated with a huge increase in capital mobility in particular, not necessarily trade, although trade does continue to grow, predominantly uh, tr uh, investment and capital flows between countries. And associated with this, we see the emergence of these big imbalances between different countries. Um, so some countries gain big, uh, have big current account deficits associated with lots of flows into their assets. Um, and other countries have big current account surpluses. Uh, so they're kind of uh, investing in other parts of the world. Uh, and what was really interesting about this period, aside from, uh, you know, the, all the things that we could say about the, the growth of this kind of very over leveraged international banking system, I think one of the most interesting things about this period is, yes, poverty decreases so quite substantially, predominantly due to the growth of, uh, of China, it becomes a middle income country, along with various other middle income countries. Those countries which sought to actually defy the rules imposed by international financial institutions operating based on the Washington consensus, saying we have to impose capital mobility, often done through structural adjustment programs and various other kind of neo-colonial methods, basically to enforce the openness to international trade and international capital flows. Those countries that, that did the best during this period, are the ones that actually 
relatively closed off to international capital flows. I'm thinking particularly here of China, whereas those uh, particularly sub-Saharan African nations, which were told if you just open up your country to capital flows from the rest of the world, you will eventually catch up. That has been shown to be a big lie. They remain really uh, uh, dependent upon commodities. They remain overloaded by debt. They're subject to massive capital outflows, particularly due to tax avoidance. And those flows often go through this network of secrecy jurisdictions um, around the world associated with the city of London. So this most recent round of financial globalization, which ended in the crisis of 2008, and since which we've seen a kind of period of deglobalization, has created a whole host of problems. And I think the reinsertion of local democracy, local accountability, and actually national democracy and national sovereignty over one's policies uh, is a really important corrective to that. Great, thank you very much. Um, Mark, I'm going to come back to you. you. You painted a very... To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.